This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Okay, we're looking at um, chapter 12 now, uh, which is Sources of Finance Debt. If you remember in the last chapter, we were looking at raising long-term finance from equity, from shareholders, uh, different ways in which you can get money from shareholders. The other way in which a company can raise money is from long-term borrowing. That's what we mean here by debt, long-term debt, long-term borrowing. Um, and so in this chapter, we're looking at uh, ways a company uh, uh, can get long-term borrowing, get finance that way. Uh, now again, uh, it really depends on um, the type of company. If we're an unquoted company, a company whose shares are not traded on the stock exchange, um, then the only way in which they can borrow is to take long-term loans. A long-term loan from the bank or from anybody, you know, if you've got a rich relative, borrow from them, but not from a bank, where uh, perhaps you arrange to borrow 10,000 from the bank, uh, normally at fixed interest, uh, talk more about that later, but uh, perhaps at interest of 5% a year, repayable in five years' time. And as far as an unquoted company is concerned, that's really it. Uh, 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 uh. It simply is take a long-term loan. However, what's much more important as far as the exam's concerned is as regards a quoted company. Because, OK, they could still take a long-term loan from the bank. Now, the only thing there, of course, is uh, there's going to be a limit to how much a bank will lend you. If I want to borrow 10,000, you know, hopefully, I find a bank to lend it me. But if we wanted to, uh, if we need to raise a million, then it's unlikely, however big the company is, that one bank will lend you that much. Okay, you may have to split it between several banks. But quoted companies have another much more important alternative, as far as the exam's concerned. They can issue what we call traded debt. And that's what I need to explain and the terminology that goes with it. Uh, and traded debt has various names. It may be called debentures. Another word is loan stock or loan notes. Uh, another word uh, what well, the Americans use, and it's more and more popular in the UK, bonds. But they're all different names for the same thing, this traded debt. And what it is, is this. Just suppose a company uh, wanted to raise, let's say, 500,000. What they can do with traded debt is instead of just going to one lender and asking, will you lend me 500,000? They advertise that they want to borrow the money. They advertise for people to lend them that money. I might be able to afford to lend them 1,000. Fine, you might be able to afford to lend them 5,000 and so on. But just like with an issue of shares, a public issue, they issue, sorry, they advertise we've got shares for sale, uh, and you find a form and say how many you want. Similarly, um, with traded debt, they advertise that they want to borrow money. Um, and they do it in units. They have units standardly of $100. In fact, it doesn't have to be $100, but in the exam, unless you're told differently, they're always units of 100. And so they advertise and say, we want to borrow 500,000. Um, they state uh, what interest rate they're offering. So, for example, they may say, 
it will be 5% interest. And they state when it's repayable. They may say it's going to be repayable in 10 years time. They advertise this and if you are prepared to lend them money, then just like buying shares in the company, here you're buying these units. You'd state how many you wanted to buy. Maybe uh, I can afford 500, so I buy five units. They'll give me a certificate. It's just like shares, but once I've got the certificate, instead of then getting a um, dividend each year, which may be high, may be low, I'm guaranteed 5% interest on the 100, I'll get $5 a year on each unit for 10 years, and then in 10 years time, they'll repay me the 100. So, I, I, I forget the legal side of things, that's irrelevant for F9. It is just like subscribing for shares, except you buy them in units of 100, uh, and, as I've said, instead of a dividend, you'll get interest each year and you'll get the repayment on whatever date you've said. Now, the reason it's called traded debt is if I've invested a hundred in this, uh, lent a hundred, and I've got my certificate, if I want, I can just sit there for the next ten years, get my interest each year, and then in 10 years time they'll repay me. Or, you know, if I decide in a few years I'd rather like the money back, I can't get the money back from the company, you know, for that I've got to wait the 10 years. But these units are traded on the stock exchange just like shares are. And so if after a few years I decide I don't want these anymore, I can sell it to somebody else via the stock exchange. And so they traded, you can buy, and when it, these are first issued, you give the money to the company. But once the company's got the money, you know, that's that. But from then on, people can uh, buy and sell to and from each other on the stock exchange. These units are quoted. And the way they quoted on the stock exchange, well, I've used the example on the, uh, in the notes, you see a quote something like 10% debentures, uh, 2,025 quoted at 96pc. Now, let me explain the terminology here. Um, each unit, each certificate, as I've said, unless you're told differently, is of $100. That's the nominal or par value. So that'll be how much um, I'd originally paid for the certificate, how much I'd lent the company. However, as I've said, once the debt's been issued, the certificates are traded on the stock exchange and the price of the certificate goes up and down, just like share prices go up and down. Uh, I'll explain why in a moment, but if it's quoted at 96, it means that one unit has a market value of $96. So the, the original unit you lent 100, but its value on the stock exchange from then on will go up and down. Today the unit happens to be uh, trading at 96, maybe next week it's trading at 110. You know, in theory it could be anything. Uh, and I'll explain why its value changes as I've said shortly. Uh, the PC uh, isn't always written in the exam, it's automatic. It actually stands for percent, so it means the market value is $96 for every 100 nominal 
the original amount that had been lent. Uh, the 10%, uh, 10 is the interest rate on the nominal. So whatever these uh, debentures, whatever the price happens to be today on the stock exchange, the interest is fixed at 10% of the original $100. So there'd be $10 per year interest. And that's also called the coupon rate. So the coupon rate, the interest on nominal, uh, $10. Now finally, in 2025, uh, that's the date of repayment. So that's really just terminology, but do be clear where we are. When the company first issued the debentures when they raised the money. People that have been uh, lending the company, that have been paying, that have been subscribing uh, in units of $100. They'll be getting $10 a year interest on each unit. And in 2025, they'll get the $100 repaid. But as I've said, at any stage, because these are traded, you can sell your units to other people. The company doesn't care, you know, the companies have the money. The company will carry on paying interest to whoever happens to own the debentures. If I sell it to somebody else, they'll get the interest. And in 2025, they'll repay the hundred. Again, to, to whoever happens to own the debentures. Uh, why, though, does the market value change? Well, in later chapters, we'll actually show how, in theory, we can calculate a market value. But for the moment, that's not relevant. But the reason it changes is this. Presumably, when I have originally lent the money to the company, 10% was a reasonable rate of interest. You know, maybe banks uh, would give it in those days, you know, this could be five years ago when I lent the money. And maybe five years ago, banks were paying 10% interest. I was quite happy to lend the money to the company and get 10% interest. However, since then, interest rates may have changed. The companies, you know, these debentures will always pay 10% on 100. That's fixed. But maybe today, Banks are paying, ooh, 12% interest. And I want to um, sell my debentures to somebody else. Well, if somebody else is thinking of investing money, they know they can get, let's say, 12% from the bank. So why on earth should they pay me 100 for this debenture and only get 10%? They won't. They will be prepared to buy it from me, but only if investing their money with me, uh, by buying my debenture, only if they were ever to end up getting 12% as well. They'll only get $10 a year. And so if they're only going to get $10 a year, surely they won't be prepared to pay 100, they'll pay a bit less than 100, because if they pay 96, and get $10 a year, they'd effectively be getting interest. They've invested 96 by buying it from me. They're getting $10 a year. And so they'll be getting interest. 10 divided by 96. Oh, they're getting 10.42%. All right, they're not getting 12, so in fact the value will be even less. But the point is, as general interest rates go up and down, as the bank's giving more or less, the people who think buying it from me will be prepared to pay more or less. Because, remember, the interest they'll get is fixed at $10 a year. 
So, you know, if, inter if bank interest rate goes down, you know, and it's only 8% or 5% or something today, I'm not going to let them have this um, for 100. They'll be getting 10%. I'll make sure they pay me a lot more. And they'll be prepared to pay me a lot more than 100 because they'll be getting $10 a year. Ooh, they could afford to pay me 200 10 dollars a year It'd be 5%, if 5% these days was a good rate of interest. Well, as I say, I'll go through uh, in a later chapter where it becomes relevant, how we can actually calculate why the market value is 96 or whatever it is. But I hope I have made it clear, and it's important, that the 10% is the rate on nominal, the $100, and therefore, it's $10 a year. That is fixed. But once they've been issued and they trade on the stock exchange, the value on the stock exchange, the value individuals can buy and sell certificates from each other, that will go up and down as current interest rates uh, elsewhere go up and down. So that's what we mean by traded debt. But a little bit more in that it's always a problem for a, a company when they're issuing debt to decide what rate of interest to offer. Because on the one hand, obviously, they want to pay as little interest as they can. You know, it's an expense to the company. But on the other hand, they've got to offer enough interest so that people will be prepared to lend the money. So if I'm going to issue debt today, I'll look to see what rate of interest banks and things are paying. And if they're paying 8%, well, I'm going to have to offer somewhere about 8% to persuade people to lend me money, I think fairly clearly. But at the same time, I would rather be paying much lower interest, particularly uh, with a newish company. You know, I'm going to do, use this money to invest in things. It usually takes time before the investment starts earning good money. And so I'd much rather pay lower interest rates. And so there are various ways you should be aware of in which a company can perhaps get people to lend money at lower interest rates, which, you know, why should they? And one way is to promise to repay at a premium. What I mean by that is I might say, right, uh, we're going to issue debt, it'll be 5% uh, loan stock. Repayable in 10 years time at a premium of let's say 10%. Now, what that means is, for every unit, remember the nominal value is 100, and so for every unit, we'll borrow 100. There'll be interest each year at 5% of the nominal value, so $5 per annum. But then the repayment in 10 years, instead of, as would normally be the case, repaying the $100, repaying at nominal value, we are agreeing to repay with an extra 10%. So we repay 100, together with 10% of 100, we'll repay 110. And the reason for doing that is that you see maybe 5% at the moment isn't a very good interest rate. 
Maybe banks are paying 6% or 7%. And so why is anybody going to lend me money at 5% if they could get 6 or 7% from the bank? Well, the reason is that although they're only getting 5% interest, at the end of 10 years, they're going to get this big bonus of $10. And so overall, they're ending up with a little bit more than 5%. The more I give them this, what you might call bonus, the premium at the end, the lower interest they might be prepared to accept in the meantime. And so it's a way of being able to pay a bit less interest than we normally uh, would have to. And that can be very attractive. Because I say again, uh, whatever I'm investing the money in, often in the early years, it may, not be, it may take several years to become very profitable. So here it means in the early years, we're paying less than normal interest. We're going to have to pay this big bonus at the end, but hopefully by the end of 10 years, this project's doing really well and with no problem paying the premium. So that's one way of trying, of persuading people to lend you money at a, 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 an interest rate that's lower than what you'd normally expect. Uh, a second way is to issue what we call convertible debt. And what convertible debt is, you offer debt, you know, maybe they're 5% debentures or whatever, but when it comes time for repayment, the other word for that is redemption. We repay, we redeem. So the repayment or the redemption we give the investors the choice. Investors have the choice of either take the cash or take a fixed number of shares in the company. And let me give you a little example just to make um, sure I, I'm making it clear what I mean. Suppose we issue 4% uh, bonds oops 4% bonds A convertible in five years time to 20 shares in the company. Now okay, for every unit, now remember the um, each unit is 100, so for every unit you're lending 100, you're getting $4 a year interest. In five years' time, it comes time for repayment. And you get a letter from the company telling you, oh, you know, next month uh, we're going to repay. And they give you the choice of either taking cash or taking, in this case, 20 shares in the company. And it's your choice. You do whichever you prefer. And of course, the decision you make, we don't make now, it, we only make it when it comes time for repayment. Uh, the decision you'll make as an investor, you'll say, well, what is the share price? What would I prefer to do? So suppose I tell you, in five years' time, 
the share price is A, uh, let's say, $7 per share. Well, what will you decide to do? Your choice, remember, and it's your choice. You either take cash of 100 or you get 20 shares which have a value of seven dollars each. They're worth 140. Well, of course, again, it's your choice. Surely you'd be stupid to do other than take the shares and get 140. And you don't have to keep them. I mean, if you want, you can keep them. If you don't want, you take the shares and sell them on the stock exchange. So either way around, you'd be much better off taking the shares. On the other hand, of course, it could be in five years' time that the share price is only $4 per share. And again, you'd have the choice. You either take the cash of 100 or you take shares. 20 shares worth $4 each, 80. Well, it's your choice, but I think you'd agree. I think you'd be completely mad to take the shares. You'll take the cash. Now, remember, I've said uh, already, you don't have to make the choice until it comes time for redemption. So when you've lent the money, you've no idea what's going to happen. The shares may end up being worth a lot, and you'll take shares. Shares may end up not being worth very much, and you'll take cash. So you don't make the decision until you come to the end of the period, whatever it was, five years' time. But the beautiful thing is, the reason investors like these is because if the company does well, the share price will get higher and higher, and you'll get back a lot more at the end. If things go wrong and the company does badly, well, you're guaranteed to get at least 100. It can't be any worse. So it's beautiful, you know, buy shares in a company and the share price may go up a lot, it may go down a lot, there's the risk. But buy convertible debt in a company, if share price goes up, you end up getting the benefit. If it goes down, you don't lose, you'll get the hundred. Provided that is, of course, the company doesn't collapse uh, and could afford the cash. But otherwise, uh, I think mean, that's beautiful. And the company likes this as well for two reasons. Uh, one is that with ordinary um, debt, I forget the convertible bit, you're paying interest each year, but then there comes a time you have to repay. And where's the cash going to come from to be able to repay? They've either got to have been saving up cash so they can afford to repay the lenders, or they're going to have to raise more finance to have enough cash to repay. Well, the beauty of convertibles, or one beauty of convertibles, is that provided the share price is high enough, they've not got a cash flow problem repaying. Because in the debenture holders, the, the lenders won't be wanting cash or want shares. And so the company's no cash flow problem. They don't need to have stored up all this cash. So that's quite attractive to the company. And the other reason is that because investors tend to like this, they won't always make a big profit, but they're hoping they will. You know, that they'll end up getting 140 in this case. Because uh, lenders like it, they're usually prepared to accept a lower interest rate in the meantime. So again, it could be that, you know, banks and things are paying 5, 6, 7% interest. 
We are looking for ways of paying lower interest. Well, we're paying lower interest 4%. Why is anybody being prepared to accept 4%? Because they're expecting, are hoping, that in five years' time, you know, they'll end up making a lot more. So that's what convertibles are. Again, there can be numbers relating to these, but it, it's a later chapter where we look at how we actually, how the market value of things is arrived at. Uh, finally, uh, warrants are uh, less likely to be mentioned, but um, in fact, I don't think they ever have been, but they could be. Uh, a warrant, if it is mentioned, don't confuse it with convertibles. Again, we're trying to find a way of making the debt attractive to investors so that they accept a lower interest rate. And what a warrant is, when they get their certificate for the, uh, the debt, attached to it is this warrant. Um, and it entitles them, the holder, to buy shares in the company at a fixed price on a fixed future date. So, we might issue 6% bonds uh, repayable in 2020 and find those bonds on every hundred there'll be six dollars a year interest and in 2020 uh, they'll be repaid a hundred. But attached to it there would be something saying they're in a warrant which entitles them, for example, to buy, let's say, 20 shares at a fixed price of $2 per share in, let's say, 2015. And suppose I tell you the current share price is $1.50. All right, well, the bonds themselves, I've already said, completely separately, they pay $6 a year interest. In 2020, they'll get back $100. This warrant that they get in 2015 they'll uh, be entitled to buy 20 shares at $2. Now, they don't have to buy them, it'll be up to them. At the moment, the share price is only $1.50. So they will pay $2. But you see, by 2015, I've forgotten, we're past that already. Suppose currently the year is 2000. We're currently in, in 2000. And the share price is $1.50. By 2015, hopefully, the share, the company will have grown a lot and the shares will be worth a lot more. And if it turns out by 2015 that the shares are worth, uh, have a market value of $3 each, we've got the right to buy them at only $2. And we can then sell them at $3 and make a nice big profit. This is attractive. It's not guaranteed, obviously. The share price in 2015, maybe lower than $2. I throw the warrant away and I've not gained anything. But there's obviously a fair chance the shares will be worth a lot more and I'll end up making a profit. Whatever happens, I'll be repaid my 100 on the bonds. But again, it's quite attractive because you think there's a reasonable chance you'll make a profit from this warrant.
you're probably going to be prepared to accept a lower interest rate than you'd otherwise demand. So that's uh, why uh, companies might issue them. And again, all three things I've mentioned, repaying at a premium, issuing convertible debt, or attaching warrants, there are all ways the company might consider as a way of being able to pay a lower interest rate than they'd otherwise need to. All right, a couple of final things. Uh, again, let me write up an example, um, a straight debt, forget convertibles and things, to explain. I suppose I told you we had 8% bonds 2020 quoted at 80. I've already said 8% is the coupon rate It's the interest on nominal. So every $100 certificate, $8 a year. If, you were, if these were issued a while ago and you're thinking of buying one of these units on the stock exchange today, you can buy it for 80 and you'll still be getting $8 a year. So somebody buying that, if somebody buys it from somebody else on the stock exchange, they'll pay 80, they'll still get $8 a year. And so on the 80 they're investing, they're getting 10% return. Well, that's called the interest yield. Doesn't affect the company. The company borrowed the money several years ago, they're paying a fixed 8%. We're talking about here the market value when one investor sells their certificate to another investor. If you're able to buy one at 80 and you're getting $8 a year, effectively you're getting 10% on the amount you've invested. Let me add on one bit though. Suppose I told you these bonds are repayable, redeemable, at a premium of 10%. Now, okay, the interest yield, year by year, you're still getting 8 on 80, 10%. However, in, uh, when we get to 2020, remember, you've only paid 80 and it's going to be repayable. The premium's always based on nominal or par value. It's going to be repaid 110. So you're paying 80 for something that in the year 2020, you'll get back 110. So overall, you end up with a lot more than 10% a year. Year by year, you're getting 10%, fine, $8. But you're getting this huge bonus at the end if you only pay 80 and you get back 110. So the overall return you're getting, in this case, will be much more than 10%. Now you can't be asked to work out the overall return. It's actually not hard, but you can't be asked to calculate it. But it is, I hope you understand me, it's going to be a lot higher if we look at the overall picture, cash of 10% each year on the 80 you've invested, plus this big bonus of 30 at the end of the period. Now, as I say, you can't be asked to work that out. You know, maybe the overall return is equivalent to about 15% a year. However, you are expected to know the name. It's called the redemption yield. So it's a total return, a combination of the interest, the interest yield, and the, the bonus you'll end up at the end. 
Okay, finally, I've mentioned two extra things in this chapter. Uh, where no arithmetic, but uh, the exam expects you to have heard of them. Two quite recent things. The first one, crowdfunding. Uh, now, as I have written there, this isn't actually debt finance. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. But I wasn't going to have a separate chapter just on this. Crowdfunding particularly applies to a new startup. They need to raise money. And a way that's become quite popular very recently, you may have heard of something called Kickstarter. There are several companies do it. Where well, you've had this new idea. Uh, I've invented a new pen, which does fancy things, and need money to be able, you know, to get the equipment and to start producing it. And rather than um, start issuing shares or rather than go and take a loan from the bank, there are websites where you can advertise your new idea. Uh, you say how much money you're trying to raise. Ooh. To start production, uh, you know, I'm going to need to raise $20,000. And you ask people to give you money. Whatever they want, you know, somebody might give $10, somebody might give 20 uh, I, I forgot how much I needed. Did I say I needed ten thousand? Well, fine. If we get the, if we don't get the ten thousand, fine. The whole thing's scrapped. The money's not taken from people until I know I've had enough promises. You give credit card details. But I, why should anybody give me ten dollars, twenty dollars, whatever? Well, you promise them something in return. Uh, like perhaps anybody who gives at least twenty dollars. They will get a free pen when I come to make it. Or maybe this pen is going to sell for a hell of a lot of money, but they will be able to buy it at a cheap price. So that's the sort of thing um, that's offered. You know, I saw one the other day. Um, somebody got this wonderful new suitcase you know, to pack clothes in. But it was wonderful, like all sorts of pockets and things. Uh, and the, uh, the, they intend to sell it, I can't remember, I think it was something like $400. Well, anybody who agreed to lend, give them money now, give them money, not lend it, um, they could get the bag for $300. So if they promised to give me $300, then they'd get this bag when its normal price is going to be $400. So that's crowdfunding. It, it's done over the internet. You've got access, obviously, to hundreds of people, or thousands of people. Uh, it's not borrowing, though. They give you the money to persuade them. You give them something in return, a free product or a discount. Uh, the other is peer-to-peer -peer funding. And this is a source of finance. And again, it's started to become a lot more popular. Uh, and it's because of the internet. But you see, conventionally, for an ordinary loan, you borrow the money from the bank and pay them interest. And where's the bank getting money from? It's because there are other people depositing money in the bank and they receive interest. And of course, if you deposit money with the bank, they might give you 3% interest. They lend the money to other people and charge them 6% interest to make a big profit. And so what peer-to-peer -peer funding is, is where you don't go through a bank. I've got some spare money to lend. Somebody else needs to borrow money. Fine, I'll lend it directly to you. And as a result, you'll pay less, you know, the bank would have charged 6%. I'll only charge you 5%. So you get lower interest. But at the same time, the 5% I'm getting is more than the bank would give me. So it's where individuals lend directly to each other. 
or companies. You're cutting out the middleman, the bank. The bank makes a profit when they uh, borrow and lend money by cutting them out. Uh, the lender can get higher interest than they get from the bank. The borrower can pay lower interest than they'd have to pay to the bank. They both gain. Uh, obviously, there's a risk. Do it through the bank and, you know, you don't lose your money. Here, if I lend money directly to you, how, how do I know how safe I am? You know, how do I know you're going to pay me? And so there are various schemes to introduce an element of guarantee and insurance to take away some of the risk. But these peer-to-peer -peer individual companies lending directly to and from each other. Okay, so sorry that was all talk, but um, we need the terminology. And particularly on traded debt, there's quite a lot of calculation exercises that we, we, we can be asked to do in later chapters. So check your heart with the terminology, then I don't have to repeat it all.